Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Scott Newbold. I'm a member of the biology faculty at Sheridan College. Um, tonight, we're excited to come together virtually again for our next installment of the Sheridan College Museum of Discovery Science Lecture Series. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, uh, I'd like to just announce that our last lecture of the spring series will be on April 21st. Matt Craig is a colleague in the biology department at Gillette College, and he's going to help us understand um, the gene editing tool CRISPR. So that's April 21st, seven o'clock, probably also by Zoom. Um, so look for that announcement coming ahead. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to, to introduce tonight's speaker, Bob McDowell. Uh, many of you know Bob and might be familiar with some of his work in research and development related to automotive catalysts. He was part of the team that brought the first commercial three-way catalyst from conception into production and has manufactured emission control catalysts on four continents. He currently advises a diverse set of clients working in R&D and prototyping areas, including lithium ion batteries, biofuels, precious metal recycling, and emission control catalysts. What you may not know but might suspect is that Bob has many irons in the fire all the time. Uh, in addition to his catalyst consulting work, he's recently developed a project, recent might be a stretch, but now it sounds like he's continuing this, uh, exploring the efficacy of various methods to isolate pure graphene, um, which has many potential applications. And then more recently, over the past two years, he's, he's done some traveling to California to work on some of the hydrogen storage and hydrogen fuel cell and catalyst issues, um, some of which I'll talk about tonight. So uh, tonight I'll share some of that work and talk about the broader picture of the hydrogen economy and where we're headed, or we at least we might be headed in the near future. So please welcome Bob McDowell. Thanks, Bob, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Scott. And Thanks for the Sheridan College for giving me a chance to talk about some of the, the interesting stuff that's going on, uh, especially in regards to hydrogen. Uh, tonight, I'd, I'd like to go over a few hydrogen facts, get everybody a little bit aware of what hydrogen uh, can do, and then uh, talk about the impacts to Wyoming and you know possible responses that we in Wyoming can do uh, to ease the, the transition from a fossil fuel economy over to a uh, more uh, a renewable type of energy economy. So the questions that I come up with whenever I, I ask about new things is, is what is it all about? Why is it important? Where is it being implemented? How soon does it have to come? And in this case, how will it affect Wyoming? Um, Bear with me for a second here. Um, we can start answering those questions after I, I give you some more background then on, on hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, how we make it and how we use it. Uh, hydrogen as a, as a gas or as a molecule contains two atoms and they're the smallest atoms. And when they are stuck together, they actually uh, form uh, one of the, the smaller molecules. And that makes it have some interesting uh, characteristics. And uh, one of the characteristics, interesting characteristics of the hydrogen is that it's about 11 times lighter, the gas is about 11 times lighter than the air we breathe. Hence, you can use it to, to lift hydrogen balloons up in the air. And uh, it, it, uh, because it is uh, so small and so light, uh, it can be filtered or uh, uh, find its way through many materials. It can actually pass through iron. Uh, the, the atoms are so small uh, so that when you use, uh, want to use a, a pipe with hydrogen, uh, you have to coat it the inside of the iron pipe. Otherwise, it'll, the gas will actually diffuse through the iron. Um, hydrogen also is kind of neat. It turns into a liquid at minus 253 degrees C. Uh, so in order to, to turn it into a liquid, you have to get it super cold. How we make it, well, obviously you don't make an element, but how do we get hydrogen out of our surroundings? Uh, the way that uh, we did it back in junior high school in chemistry class was we took water and passed an electric current through it and broke the hydrogen bond. So that gave us 
basically two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. And you hook it up to a, a battery or electric current, and you can break the water molecule into the hydrogen and oxygen gas. Uh, that's the process that's called electrolysis. You'll hear me talk about electrolysis tonight. Using electricity to break the bonds is electrolysis. You can also get hydrogen from hydrocarbons. One of the lightest hydrocarbons is, is methane or natural gas. And in this case, uh, you have four hydrogen atoms attached to one carbon atom. So uh, one of the ways that uh, we can split this off is by just pure heat or by electrolysis or by chemical reactions. And you can get four hydrogen atoms for every carbon atom that you have from natural gas. The process uh, that makes most of the hydrogen today is called steam methane reforming. You'll hear me talk about SMR tonight. And steam comes from water. If you add water to the methane, obviously the two hydrogens from water, the four from the, from the hydrocarbon from natural gas gives you six hydrogens. You get a little bit of extra a boost if you add water to the, to the natural gas when you split it up. Uh, the methane is another, another name for natural gas. And reforming, the SMR part, the R part is reforming where you're taking these molecules, you're breaking them up and rearranging or reforming them. Seems like, uh, here's some characteristics of hydrogen. It seems like hydrogen would be a great fuel. If you look at the left-hand column, the specific energy of hydrogen, you see it's got nearly three times the energy of gasoline or diesel. Uh, so it seems like it would be an ideal fuel. Uh, you can go three times further on one pound of hydrogen than you can go on one pound of gasoline or diesel. So it seems like it'd be a, a good fuel, fuel to use. But the, the problem is in the second column, the energy density. If hydrogen is so light, that you would need a fuel tank 3,500 times bigger than the gasoline fuel tank if you were just using hydrogen gas at sea level. So obviously you don't wanna be pulling a large trailer around carrying the hydrogen gas. We have ways around that. But again, it's, it's one of the main issues that we're facing today is the, the low energy density. Uh, we like the high specific energy. Uh, how do you make the hydrogen? I mentioned steam methane reforming. Uh, you see on this pie chart here in the gray, steam methane reforming accounts for about 48% of it. Uh, still a lot of hydrogen is made by gasifying coal. That was started back in the 1870s, 1860s. Uh, they used to gasify coal and use it to light street lamps with. Um, and then about 30% comes from oil. Again, the reforming part means they rearrange the molecules and they, they get hydrogen during the time that they, the uh, process of, re, of uh, oil refining. And about 4% is by the electrolysis method, the old high school lab method. All that natural gas or coal or oil is not too climate friendly. Uh, and so what uh, the folks have done is they've named different types of hydrogen processes. The hydrogen gas is all the same. It doesn't care how you make it. But the process, the way you make it, uh, gets these different names. Black, brown, gray, blue, green hydrogen. Uh, green hydrogen, as you might suspect, is uh, not made with, with hydrocarbons or fossil fuels. It's made with renewable energy, wind, or uh, solar power. Uh, people also call nuclear power green. So that gets the green label. The black and the brown are typically uh, named after the coal, getting hydrogen from coal. The gray is getting hydrogen from natural gas, that steam methane reforming that I mentioned. And blue hy hydrogen is if you get black, gray, or brown hydrogen and don't let the CO2, don't let the carbon dioxide back out into the atmosphere. If you capture it, or if you can uh, sequester it or uh, 
basically uh, bury it so it doesn't come back into the atmosphere, then we call that blue hydrogen. And so when you see the lot of news, news items now about hydrogen, you'll see an awful lot about blue hydrogen. And that's where they use this carbon capture technique. And the ultimate goal for everyone obviously is the green hydrogen. So uh, how do you make the hydrogen? Number of different ways. The, one of the most interesting and newest way that people are doing, there's a company in Nebraska that's using microwave plasma to turn natural gas into hydrogen and carbon. And they're making a carbon product. The plasma is very, very hot, 10,000 degrees, hotter than you can uh, make anything uh, without electricity or without a plasma. Uh, and a plasma is just basically a gas so hot that the molecule comes apart and you're dealing with ions instead of molecules. So what these guys do is use a microwave to get very hot gas, to get very hot plasma, and they pump in a feedstock, natural gas. They go into this central reactor. The molecules of natural gas, as soon as they hit that reactor, are ripped apart by the plasma. As the molecule drops down, sorry, as the, the ions drop down, uh, they turn into a gas, and that gas uh, comes out as hydrogen. And as you drop down further, you get much, much cooler. The carbon gas turns into carbon solid and actually into what we call carbon black. And uh, that is a product, a commercial product. So this process is a, a blue hydrogen man way of manufacturing. And uh, carbon black, another interesting fact, one of the jobs I had when I was working through college was in a tire factory. And the reason tires are black is from all the carbon. Carbon is used to add to the rubber, and it's also used to add to plastics these days to give it strength or even conductivity purposes. But the reason your tires are black is from the carbon black. Now, you don't have to go to 10,000 degrees to rip apart molecules. You can rip apart molecules at 2,000 degrees. And one of the ways that people are thinking about this, they haven't done it yet, is to make commercial quantities of hydrogen from water uh, using solar power, whereby the sun shines on a bunch of mirrors and the mirrors focus the light from acres and acres of land onto a, a solar receiver, they call it, where it gets to 2000 degrees C. That just the high temperature, you don't need a plasma, just the high temperature will rip apart the water molecule and give you hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And if you scale it down a little bit, make it a little bit less unwieldy, you can use this parabolic dish concentrator. Again, you can get very high temperatures, but obviously only when the sun is shining. And this is a type of green hydrogen. The most hydrogen, uh, as we remember that pie chart, most of the hydrogen today is made with steam methane reforming. And what that uh, method is, you pump your natural gas or you can use some other uh, feedstocks and steam into a reactor that's heated up to about 900 degrees C. So those two items react typically with a catalyst to, to make it happen faster. And the water breaks up hydrogen and oxygen. The natural gas breaks up into hydrogen and carbon. And you get what's called a syngas coming out, a mixture of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, methane, but also out at the very end, you get your pure hydrogen gas. So again, it's a, uh, the most uh, commercially viable method today, but it is what is called gray hydrogen, where you're, you are dumping a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. If you take that very same procedure, and instead of dumping it into the atmosphere, if you take that carbon dioxide emission and pump it underground, in this case, uh, through an offshore oil well, you can pump it into a, a sandstone or a, a very deep brine uh, formation underground and sequester the carbon. Sequestering just means burying it forever. Uh, and you can actually bury it, if you will, in a depleted oil field. And the carbon dioxide will react with the oil and make it less viscous, make it less gooey, 
uh, so it flows better and you can actually get more oil out of it. So out of the out of that carbon out of that uh, formation. So in this case, the blue hydrogen methodology might actually let you pump out more fossil fuel, which uh, might cause greater uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The steam methane reforming is large scale only. Uh, this is a, a typical uh, steam methane reforming complex and uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to set it up. Usually they're built right next to oil wells or natural gas wells or within a big refinery complex. You can't put these in your, in your little towns and villages. What you can put in little towns and villages is the electrolysis method. Remember I talked about earlier about splitting water with electricity. The anode and the cathode are basically just two pieces of metal here. Uh, the power in, in high school was a flashlight battery, a D cell battery. Uh, if you pump in large amounts of power into a large number of these uh, electro electrolytic cells, you can make quite a bit of hydrogen gas. And it's green if it comes from solar or wind or hydropower. Nuclear power is also carbon free. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. It can also be fossil fuel power if you want. So if it's, if it's renewable energy, it's green. And again, just to recap, the, the green hydrogen comes from wind or nuclear, solar, or it could even be geothermal or hydro. And this is a, just a photograph of one of the big alkaline uh, electrolyzers that they use up in Norway. Uh, they have a lot of, of spare hydropower. Uh, so they've made uh, hydrogen gas for a long time and use it to make ammonia fertilizer, which is nitrogen, a combination of nitrogen and hydrogen. So that's how we make it. How do we use it? Well, the big headlines obviously are for vehicles. The tractor trailer up here is a, a Budweiser beer truck, the first hydrogen fuel cell truck in the, in the US, actually on a commercial route. This double decker you might suspect is from London. Uh, it's powered by uh, fuel cells as well. These trucks are Hyundai's, the first batch of Hyundai's being unloaded from a ship from Korea. They're gonna drive them over to Switzerland. Uh, they've ordered a fleet of a thousand Hyundai tractor trailers. And this blue car here is, is a Hyundai, uh, sorry, is a, a Toyota. It's a Toyota fuel cell car called a Marai. And you can actually buy these in California for $58,000. And the white truck here is a pickup truck that I like the looks of, but uh, it's also uh, just a prototype right now. They, this is also a, a Nikola truck. Uh, they, GM were gonna make it, but they backed out of the deal. Oop, wrong dot. So how can we use the hydrogen? Well, this is a diagram of a, an engine cylinder, typically a, a standard piston engine. So you can burn it just like gasoline or diesel into a car's engine. This is a, a BMW V12 that they ran for a while. It was in the luxury model, the, the BMW 7 Series. A very nice car, it was about 10 years ago, very nice car and very, very powerful engine. You can also burn the hydrogen in a natural gas pipeline system. In fact, the Germans are doing this today. Uh, this is a map of the, the US pipeline, interstate pipeline system. And you can see uh, quite a bit of, bit of uh, natural gas throughout our country. And in fact, throughout all the developed world, uh, we can, we or the Germans can actually pump about 5% of the pipeline capacity with hydrogen so you get a mixture of hydrogen and natural gas. And you can burn that in your house, in your furnace, in your hot water heater, in your kitchen stove. And obviously if you're burning hydrogen instead of natural gas, you're not putting as much CO2 into the atmosphere. So uh, very good from the, from the climate standpoint. The other way that you can burn hydrogen is in a gas turbine engine. The, the jet engines that you see on the, on the, the big planes, the 747s and the Airbuses, 
are actually not the biggest jet engines around. Uh, the ones that are used in the natural gas power plants to make electricity are much larger. Uh, those engines uh, can be modified to run on hydrogen. They running again about uh, five to eight percent hydrogen right now with those uh, big electrical generating gas turbines. The vast majority of hydrogen that we use in the United States today is not for fuel. We don't burn it for fuel or for power. We actually use it uh, for, for industry, number one, for the oil industry. If you have crude oil, most crude oil has sulfur in it. And we don't like to burn sulfur in our stoves or houses or even outside these days because you get sulfur oxide, which is a pollutant that turns into sulfuric acid, kills the fish in the lakes, all that kind of good stuff. So what they do is they take the sulfur out of the crude oil by adding hydrogen to it and you get hydrogen sulfide which they can then turn into sulfur, pure sulfur, and use it for a fertilizer. The other big use of it is in the steel making industry. You can use hydrogen instead of coke to reduce the steel. And if you use hydrogen, you get low carbon steel, which is a, a value, has a value added uh, feature to it. So if you had to use hydrogen as soon as you made it from electricity, it wouldn't be that valuable. I mean, you can't keep your car plugged in all the time to make hydrogen to run a fuel cell. So there has to be some way to store the hydrogen to make it useful. And Mitsubishi's come up with this plan here where they have the renewable energy, the solar or the wind power or whatever renewable energy you have. You feed that energy into the electrolyzer to split water to make hydrogen and oxygen. Typically the oxygen is just uh, bled off into the atmosphere. And the hydrogen can be stored in tanks. And when you need more electricity, say for example, when the sun goes down or the wind doesn't blow, you can burn the hydrogen that you made previously in one of these gas turbines to light up the city at night. And I mentioned the fuel cell cars. If you have a fuel cell car, you're not actually physically burning that hydrogen. You're doing the electrolyzer process in reverse. Instead of splitting the water into hydrogen and oxygen molecules, what you're doing here in the fuel cell is electrically, chemically, adding the hydrogen to the oxygen to get energy out. And that energy comes out as electricity. So if you think about the two, they are exactly reversed. One, you split water into hydrogen and oxygen. The other, you add hydrogen and oxygen. You make water, but you also get power out again. And this diagram on the right is what's called a fuel cell. Uh, it's exploded diagram. The membrane electrode assembly has got a catalyst on it to make this happen, or at least make it happen more quickly. And the rest of it, uh, is very complex way of feeding the hydrogen and oxygen in. And you, when you do that, you also get water coming out. So that there's mass transport issues. There's ways you have to handle that water to make this thing useful. A guy by the name of William Grove figured out this fuel cell back in the 1830s, 1840s. And although he figured it out, nobody could, could figure out how to make it work economical until we got uh, a lot more sophisticated with our materials and with the engineering technology to put these together. The first fuel cells really to be used were in the NASA space program back in the 60s uh, to prov provide power for the Gemini and the uh, Mercury space capsules. So if you got a fuel cell now, what do you do with it? Well, if you've got these fuel cells, if you stack 300 of these things together, and package it along with cooling and electrical generators and some other things, compressors to feed the air in and a radiator to keep things cool, you wind up with a, a fuel cell engine. And you can see it's, I've got in the title here, it's more efficient, a fuel cell is more efficient than an ICE, an internal combustion engine. Very, very efficient internal combustion engines. These are very, uh, uh, prototy prototypes right now of diesel engines can get up to 50% uh, 
efficiency. Typical is, is 35 to 40% efficiency. But a fuel cell now is 60% efficient and they're trying to get it even higher. So for a given amount of fuel, a fuel cell system a powertrain is much more efficient than the internal ICE, internal combustion engine powertrain. And as you can see here, this is a, a forklift being fueled up inside a warehouse. I think it's the Amazon warehouse, but I'm not sure. The typically Amazon, Walmart, and the, the big European warehouses, food distributors, are all using these hydrogen forklifts instead of electric forklifts because they can run for eight hours in a shift and it only takes about five minutes to refuel it. They don't have to swap out batteries and keep charging them all the time. And that's one of the advantages of cars. This is that uh, Toyota fuel cell car I mentioned before, the Mirai. There's about 50 fueling hydrogen fueling stations now in California. If you buy one of these cars, you get about 300 miles to the tank full and it takes fills up the same as a gasoline. You go up to a pump and you fill it up. Doesn't have to be small cars and forklifts either. Uh, this is a hundred ton mine, mining vehicle down in South Africa. They're using it in a platinum mine today. This is a car ferry running in between different cities in Norway and Denmark. Again, hydrogen fueled, but through this fuel cell. So the fuel cell creates the electricity, but they use electric motors then to push the, the wheels or to turn the propellers. So just a quick recap, what do we use the hydrogen for? We can use it for vehicles, buses, trucks, trains, ships. We can use it for the grid to generate electricity. We can balance the grid so we have continual power when the sun goes down or the wind stops. And we can use it for industrial heat or steam. But we can also use it for fertilizer. I mentioned ammonia. You can make a lot of fertilizer with the hydrogen. Ammonia is NH3, the molecule. So three hydrogens and one nitrogen makes, it, makes a, the, the leaves go green very quickly. And again, uh, you can make other chemicals besides ammonia and fertilizers. You can make methanol. You can actually go up the, the scale and use it just like an oil refinery. You can get plastics and other hydrocarbon uh, products out of it. And some people have even used fuel cells for cell phones. Uh, they, little bit of a, uh, last a lot longer than the typical cell phone battery. So how do we store real hydrogen? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this company is talking about going from the windmills or solar cells to an electrolyzer. They get the hydrogen out of that and then they turn it into natural gas. So again, just the reverse of that steam methane reforming process that I talked about. You're, you're making the, the natural gas again, and then you just pump it into the natural gas system as if it were natural gas, because it, it's exactly the same. You can use it to, to burn in your factories. You can fuel natural gas vehicles with it. Uh, you can use it in your hot water heaters at night. However, this is not hydrogen. This is natural gas that you're storing. If you want to store hydrogen, it's a little trickier. Two main ways to store the hydrogen are physical storage, and material storage. The physical base storage, you can see there is compressed gas, cryo cold compressed or liquid hydrogen. The physical side of things is basically brute force. You've got this very light gas and you wanna get it as heavy as you can. How do you do that? You squeeze it down into a small space. So you run high pressure uh, to get it as much of it as you can into the uh, the hydrogen gas storage cylinder. If you make it cold, if you make it cryogenic cold below 100 degrees, minus 100 degrees, you can get even more hydrogen into a, a given space, into a, into a tank. And if you turn that hydrogen into a liquid, that's how you get the most dense, most hydrogen into a tank. The material-based side of things is a little bit cleverer. Uh, Hydrogen and, and many gases, carbon dioxide, oxygen, many gases can absorb onto a surface. And depending on what that surface is, it can align the molecules up and let them pack more closely together. And so if you have an absorbent, here they have 
something that's called a metal organic framework here. Uh, if you have an absorbent, you can actually get more hydrogen to absorb onto the surface than you can by compressing it uh, without this absorbent in it. And these other mater materials are all different absorbents, but they, <clears throat> they are very complex, as you can see, very, very uh, uh, complex molecules and unfortunately <laughs> a bit expensive. One of the best absorbents that uh, they're finding out now at the National Energy Lab is something that's called porous carbon, and we can make it from coal, actually. The hydrogen gas tank is the way that most people are using the, the gas. Uh, they're using hydrogen compressed gas, and you have to have a tank for that. And the tanks that the vehicles are using are made out of this carbon fiber. You can see it's wrapped uh, around in different directions in this very large tank here. And you can automate that wrapping and, and make, make it very, very uh, strong and light. This tank here, the one that's cut open, shows you how it's made. Uh, but this would be about the size of a vehicle tank. So it would fit in your trunk or underneath the back seat. And if you cut that tank, so you can see a cross section of it, you can see it has a plastic liner, which basically is impervious to hydrogen. It stops any, any of those tiny hydrogen molecules from leaking out. And then you have the real strong carbon fiber uh, plastic layer here that gives you the, the strength of the tank to hold the, the pressure. And then you have a fiberglass layer on the outside uh, to give it some impact protection. And the reason that they use these, these fiber reinforced tanks, especially carbon fiber reinforced is because the pressures that they're working with are 350 or 500 bar. And if you convert that to the old method that I'm used to for using the oxyacetylene welding tanks, we used to run oxygen tanks, those big steel tanks were about 3000 PSI. Well, 700 bar is about 10,000 PSI, right? So very high pressure. If you tried to make a steel tank or even aluminum tank out of that, it would be super heavy, it'd be super thick, uh, would not be much use. And so that's where the, the beauty of the, the carbon fiber material comes in. You can make it a lot lighter and uh, basically run under high pressure. Uh, they use these same sorts of tanks for the, for the rocket ships. The Ariane rocket ship that they launched down in, in French Guiana uh, carries 28 tons of hydrogen and those tanks weigh about five tons, but if they were steel, that rocket ship would never get off the ground. I mentioned about the smart way to do the hydrogen storage by uh, using an absorbent. This shows a picture of a, a typical absorbent blown up where it has what's called microsphere, micropores, and it has mesopores and macropores. Macro pores are just cracks. You could almost see them. They're almost big enough to see with the, with the naked eye. These micro pores are tiny, 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 uh, just larger than a few atoms wide. And if you use something like uh, uh, porous carbon material or some of these exotic uh, oxide frameworks, you can get those hydrogen molecules to line up. And so you can get seven times more hydrogen into a tank that's filled with this absorbent, this black material, than if you started out with completely empty tank. It doesn't make makes logical sense, but that's how the, you can pack those hydrogen atoms in there. So this is going to be uh, quite a big business in the, in the near future. And when I talked about vehicles, I didn't mention airplanes, right? But this is a design for a hydrogen storage tank to go into a hydrogen fueled airplane. It runs on electric motors. It's a it's a prop engine. Uh, and instead of trying to fill it up like you do with a, a, um, uh, a standard airplane where they, they pump the oil from a tank truck on short runways and in uh, smaller airports where they can't afford that sort of thing, you could just have this two of these tanks, one of them going into the airplane, you pull the other out and swap it. And while the airplane's flying, you fill up the empty set of tanks, get ready for the next flight. 
And I mentioned liquid hydrogen. The best way to store liquid hydrogen, hydrogen is in liquid form. But as I mentioned, it has to be minus 250 some degrees. To get some stuff that cold takes energy and it takes a lot of insulation. So although they've tried using this for vehicles, the, the better uh, method for using this is to keep it stationary. This is a, a, a liquid hydrogen fuel tank uh, down at Cape Canaveral. They use it uh, for the, the rocket ships. They use it for the space shuttle and other launches. Right, so that's how we, we make and store it and how we use it. What does it cost us? Well, it depends on what you start out with. If you start out with natural gas and you use that steam methane reforming, the SMR, uh, if the natural gas is about $3, then the cost for the hydrogen is about $1.50 a kilogram. For the electrolyzers, if you're paying about 20 cents a kilowatt hour, $20 per megawatt, then the cost is about $6, uh, sorry, $6 per kilogram. So it doesn't sound feasible. Why would you pay $6 for a kilo of, of hydrogen when you could buy it for $1.50? Uh, well, the answer is the, the CO2 issue, the, the global warming issue. But they don't make very many uh, hydrogen electrolyzers these days. If they had to make as many electrolyzers as you would need for a fleet of vehicles, hydrogen vehicles, uh, they would target somewhere around 2030 that they could get enough cost savings on, on mass manufacturing the electrolyzers that they could get down to that cost parity in about 10 years time. Another thing to think about that one kilo of hydrogen has about the same energy as one gallon of gasoline, right? So a gallon of gasoline weighs about three, 3.2 kilos. But remember the fuel cell is more efficient than an internal combustion engine. The electric motor powertrain is more efficient than the automatic transmissions. So you can actually go 300 miles in a hydrogen car on five kilos of hydrogen, which would be about 60, 60 miles to the gallon. So not, even today, it's not that bad a deal. If the price does get down to $1.50 a kilo, it'd be cheaper than gasoline. That's what a kilo costs. What does it cost society? The estimate from the International Renewable Energy folks is $131 trillion by 2050. So about four and a half trillion dollars a year. That's if everything goes green, an awful lot of the grid will have to be uh, renewable and four and a half trillion dollars, that's you know more than what we've spent on the COVID uh, crisis package. So how is the world gonna handle that kind of money? Still a big question right now. Uh, finally, getting to the list of questions I started out with, what is the hydrogen economy? Uh, I think you've got an idea now. It's a subset of an electric economy, renewable energy. Instead of fossil fuels, hydrogen is a means of converting electricity to another form that can be stored and shipped easily. And it's a, an energy carrier. It's not really uh, a, a new fuel. It's an energy carrier like natural gas or gasoline is. You don't mine hydrogen, you make it. What's the, 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 the advantages of, of hydrogen over fossil fuels? Number one, if you use an electrolyzer, uh, it's an infinite supply of your water. Your, your oceans are gonna be there for many, many years. And basically when you uh, use the hydrogen, you combine it back with the oxygen, it's recycled. There is no carbon footprint. You have ways of transporting it, either compressed or actually there's a, a ship now that they've designed that they're trialing out that's gonna run hydrogen up from Australia to Japan. It does have high energy density, even though it is light. Um, it does make clean power if you make hydrogen from fossil fuels. If you use hydrogen fuel cell in your car, your car is not emitting the carbon, it's the power plant. So even today with gray hydrogen, you are getting a more efficient car out of it and you're not polluting quite as much. And the big advantage over electricity is it can be stored. Uh, no matter what Elon Musk says, makes sense to be able to store electricity for more than a, a day or a couple hours. 
the world hydrogen economy right now, China's the biggest user of hydrogen. The Middle East, United States, Europe, uh, basically the big bulk of this, this pie here is for hydrogen, for oil, for refining, for taking out that sulfur and for adding to the uh, crude oil to make lighter gasoline type uh, splits from the crude oil gallon. And China's a lot bigger because not only the crude oil, but because of they do so much of the world's steel making. Uh, it's, they also use gasified coal to make all the, the uh, polyesters and the uh, uh, fabrics today, the textiles. So if you've got a, uh, a polyester uh, bathrobe or shirt or something, part of that was probably made from Chinese coal. These are figures from the, uh, the Hydrogen Council, so they may be a little bit biased, but it's showing in 30 years that the demand for hydrogen will increase by tenfold. And again, a big bulk of that is transportation, what they figure is gonna be uh, replacing the internal combustion engine in cars and buses. Why is the hydrogen economy important? Why are we gonna spend all this money? Uh, does it make sense? Well. It does if you agree with the bulk of the civilized world that we've got to limit the global warming to less than 1.5 degrees centigrade. The climate change is you know, pretty bad situation between the, the droughts and the fires in California, the floods in Texas and Australia. And from the vehicle standpoint and from the uh, combustion side of things, not only will we be making less carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas will be less pollutants from NOx, from the methane and the particulates, all these other items that form smog and coat the, the snow up in the Arctic with black particles and make it melt faster. The chart there on the lower right hand side shows you the, the, the trend, if you will call it that, the hockey stick, where the total greenhouse gases are, are shooting way up. So we're about 400 parts, 410 parts per million today. I hate to say it, but back when I was born, we were about 300 and some. So it's, it's gone up quite a bit in my lifetime. Where is all this being implemented? Well, let me skip this slide and go to the developed countries, 15 developed countries. China is using it for fuel cell buses and cars. There's about 10,000 cars and maybe 20,000 buses already over there. Uh, they've got fueling stations. You can buy the cars and buses. Uh, Japan, again, Toyota's got the fuel cell cars. F Japan also has home fuel cells where you run your natural, natural gas instead of to a heater, you run it to a fuel cell. You get heat to heat your house in the winter, you get electricity and you get hot water. Uh, Japan uses it a lot for the steel mills. I mentioned they're importing it from Australia in a tanker now, big ship. Europe's got a huge amount of excess wind power. They have to shut it down sometimes. And sometimes they have to pay people to use electricity. They have so much. So bright idea, why not make hydrogen feed it into the natural gas pipeline and you can get paid for that. Korea, a lot of fuel cell cars. Again, the Hyundai trucks I showed you. Uh, they also make a car called the Hyundai Nexo, which you can also buy in California. Uh, they're looking at converting the uh, liquefied natural gas that they import from the Middle East into hydrogen. Uh, Australia, a uh, lot of solar power, so they're interested in hydrogen, but they've also got a lot of uh, low-grade brown coal, so they're turning that into hydrogen, planning to turn it into hydrogen and ship it to Japan. When will it happen? Uh, different times for different countries. They all have plans they call roadmaps, you see the United States down at the bottom. I didn't put it there because of alphabetical order. I put it there because we're probably uh, the furthest behind everybody. Uh, but either 2040 or 2050, they'll stop the, use, the sale of uh, internal combustion engine cars. And Europe and, the, Europe and uh, Asia and China, uh, Japan, Korea, are all spending many millions of dollars trying to get this hydrogen society kicked off. How will it affect the Wyoming? Uh, well, we've been an exporter for too long, just like the, the 13 colonies were back in the 1700s. Uh, England used to use the colonies as a, as a raw material 
and then as a, a consumer, the mercantile policy, they called it. Wyoming should be selling hamburger, not selling cattle. We should be selling Tide and not selling Trona. We should be selling high density polyethylene milk bottles and not natural gas. We should be selling $10,000 a ton carbon fiber instead of coal. And we should be selling rare earth magnets at $44,000 plus a ton instead of the rare earth ore, right? Uh, we are going to see declining tax base uh, if, if we don't replace the oil and coal and natural gas industry uh, taxes and jobs. So we've got to bolster those, those jobs in this new hydrogen economy. We've got to develop new products from our resources. And my belief is we've got to make those things in Wyoming, get the value added out of it, put that back into Wyoming. And it comes back to educating our kids, retraining our skilled employees. Got a lot of smart workers out there. Let's get them some, some fun jobs to do. There'll be a lot of the same jobs, uh, sorry, same products and services required. We'll still need deliveries and, and UPS will still have to drop off the Amazon and warehouse stuff. So, you know, all the jobs aren't going to disappear overnight. There still will be jobs for compressors and pipelines and electrical components uh, to take care of the cars that we have today, but also learn how to, to take care and repair the cars of the future. Uh, again, it's not going to happen overnight. The demand for fossil fuels won't vanish overnight. What can we do? Uh, basically, we can start looking at new products and services, uh, things like electrical, uh, renewable electricity, electrolyzers, fuel cells, those carbon fiber storage tanks, uh, gas stations for hydrogen instead of for gasoline. What can we do? Well, let's take a look at different industries. Solar power, you need that to make hydrogen. So we're gonna need a lot of solar power. Graphene can be made into, into solar panels, put them on your roof to make hydrogen. And then you could use that hydrogen in a fuel cell in your house. That graphene can be used for the electronics and the inverters for those uh, solar panels. You could hold those panels onto your roof with carbon fibers. You can use graphite for the thermal reactors. All of these things can be made from Wyoming coal and oil. Wind turbines, obviously renewable energy, big, big uh, demand right now for wind turbines. They're putting up thousands every year. The rare earth elements goes into the generators for the magnets. It takes about 200 kilograms of rare earths for one, per one megawatt. A lot of these turbines are 12 megawatts and getting bigger all the time. So a lot of product going to be required and that's high value product. The blades, carbon fiber, just like in your tennis rackets, it makes it a hell of a lot stronger and lighter. Uh, graphene again for coatings, you can stop it from rusting, stop not the, graph the carbon fiber, but you can stop things from rusting by using uh, graphene paints. Again, all can be made from Wyoming coal. Uh, battery electric vehicles, we can make carbon body panels, structural, panels, uh, use the carbon black for the tires, graphene for the electronics. Rare earths, we can use that for the motors for vehicles. It takes about 12 kilos, I think, of rare earths for each vehicle. And you got 100 million vehicles sold every year. Some big markets that we could be supplying. Graphite can be used for insulation, building blocks. Carbon fiber can be used instead of fiberglass, just as effective and somebody's got to make those fuel cell housings, you can make them out of graphite. Porous carbons can be used for the fuel cell membranes. Graphene, again, from, from oil or from coal, natural, sorry, natural gas or coal, you can use for implants for, for your body, biosensors, touch screens are made out of graphene these days, kind of expensive. Carbon filters and purifiers, the Brita filter sitting on your kitchen sink is made out of porous carbon. Again, all of it can be made from Wyoming coal or oil. What do we do? How do we get action? Well, let's talk to the politicians. Hate to say it. Uh, chat with the governor. He's looking at funding for UW and community college programs. We can make sure the pipeline regulations allow putting hydrogen into the pipelines. Let's build as much solar and wind as we can. That way we'll have the ingredients uh, for all these different products we can make and encourage Wyoming companies and other companies to make the high value products here in Wyoming. 
Let's talk to the senators and the representative Cheney about how they can be useful. All these Department of Energy, Department of Defense, ARPA funding, all these things that uh, allow that could allow Wyoming companies to work on carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, a little bit more money for UW for basic research. And obviously, uh, community college and high school funding for the science and technology programs. Let's get our students uh, to lead and push the effort to switch to the hydrogen economy. Right now, Asia and Europe are way ahead of us. Uh, let's have another Sputnik moment where we all pull together and try to try to catch up with the rest of the world. So, went a bit longer than I thought, but if you have questions, please uh, let's let's jump onto those. Great, thanks, Bob. Um, let's see, there have been some questions that came in. So let me just start here. So in the near future, do you see hydrogen fuel cell vehicles becoming a better alternative to battery electric vehicles? I think there's a place for each. Batteries might be best for around town when you're not pushing them hard. If you wanna go cross country, you don't have you know three hours to wait while you recharge your car, then the hydrogen is, is the better bet. Uh, again, it, it's, uh, I think it depends more on the use. That's why Nicolo decided to use fuel cells for the heavy duty tractor trailers. They wanted those to be long haul things. If you're a UPS driver, you turn the engine on and off, you know, 200 times in a day, a battery might be better for you on local deliveries. If you're delivering out to U-Cross or something every day, maybe you want hydrogen. All right, I'm just going to put out there, uh, if you do have questions, you can submit them in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen, if you mouse over that, um, and uh, we can try to run those by Bob and see. So let's see, Bob, another one. How dangerous is it to handle hydrogen, i.e. just getting it to some sort of storage from production to a distribution center and then into a tank? Okay, I don't know if you still have the screen up there, but take a look. Everybody asks the question about hydrogen safety. Actually, hydrogen is safer than gasoline. The Hindenburg is, everybody worries about the Hindenburg. What set that off was lightning and they painted the canvas with airplane dope, basically glue, you know, airplane glue. So all the fire you see there is from the canvas, the aluminum coating on the canvas and the airplane glue. Hydrogen, when it burns, uh, doesn't burn with a, much of an infrared flame. It's very hard to see the flame. Uh, handling it, uh, yes, if, you're, if you have liquid hydrogen, it's going to be very difficult to handle. You'll get burned because it's so cold. Uh, for the gas itself, we use natural gas today for all sorts of different things. Uh, the hydrogen high pressure is a concern. Uh, this here is a, shows you two cars with a leak in the gas. One is a gas tank and one is a hydrogen tank. And if you look at it, the gas tank one is the one that's got the brightest flame. It's more deadly because it has radiant heat. Uh, neither one is good, obviously. So uh, that's why they spend so much time on those carbon fiber tanks, figuring out how to wrap them with those fibers and get them uh, impact resistant. So I would myself would have no problem dealing with it. But uh, again, it's, it's, uh, I think it depends on what you're used to and people getting used to handling it. Great. So in terms of um, rare earth elements in Wyoming, there's a question about do we have rare earth elements in Wyoming and what are, what are those, um, you know, what are those resources? Yeah, we, we do. Uh, there's a, a mine that's planning to be permitted over by Devil's Tower. Um, that's been in the works for a while, but it hasn't started yet. Uh, there's a big mine in California. Uh, there's a couple of other rare earth resources in Wyoming, one down south of Interstate 80. Uh, I forget exactly where, uh, but uh, one of the big areas that, that uh, uh, I've been interested in for a while is there are a lot of rare earths in the Powder River coal, uh, oh. apparently washed out uh, during the formation. So in the, either in the coal or in the clay right above and below it, there's a lot of rare earth as well. So if you're mining the coal, why not take advantage of it and mine a little bit deeper and get the rare earth as well? All right, another question about lithium ion batteries. So what are the benefits of using hydrogen as energy storage compared to lithium ion batteries? Again, different, different uh, uh, uses maybe uh, will lend you to one or the other. Hydrogen 
basically a fuel cell, you can make it very powerful. Uh, you know, 300 horsepower will fit in your, you know, the engine bay of your car. It's kind of hard to, to get that much electricity uh, into a battery. You have to sling those batteries underneath the bottom of the car. Uh, again, for, for driving short distances or when the motor's on and off quite a bit, uh, you're probably better than a, uh, with a lithium ion battery. There are new lithium ion battery designs. They're about 10 or 12 years away yet, I think, where they are going to get more powerful. So the battery will be smaller, but the fuel cells obviously are going to be getting more efficient as well. So it's probably a trade off there. Hmm. Okay, great. Um, as we talk about going away from our reliance on coal and oil, what will we do when it comes to lubricating anything that moves? Things have metal to metal contact. Everything's bearing. Everything has a bearing in order to move. How do we uh, go about lubricating and cooling these services? Again, I, I, I don't think oil and gas are going to go away. Uh, certainly within the next hundred years, uh, but you know, in the next five hundred years, we don't tend to think that long. What you can do with with hydrogen is you can, like as I say, you can make chemicals with it. So if you combine the hydrogen with wood or any other form of carbon, coal, if we've used up all the coal, if we've used up all the oil, uh, we can still use plant matter uh, and get carbon out of that. And uh, then you've got the hydrocarbons and then you can build those complex molecules up for lubricants. But carbon's not a bad lubricant. You use graphite lubricants for high temperature bearings. So again, it depends on what the application is. Uh -huh. You can always grow oil like uh, olive oil or rapeseed oil or the, you know corn oil for that matter for, for low temperature, low pressure applications. Great. Bob, what's your sense moving forward into the future given the way the rest of the world is moving? Does it feel inevitable that this is coming, that we're gonna be transitioning to hydrogen fuel cells or? I do, I yeah. do. Uh, again, I'm biased. I've been trying to work in this area now for a couple of years and. Uh, it's fascinating chemistry, it's fascinating economics, if that sort of thing uh, is of interest to you. Uh, but again, it's, it's going to impact us one way or another, and I think there's a lot we can do to, to make it a, a positive impact. Great. Last one from Margie. So do you see the major role for Wyoming as producing blue hydrogen? Exactly. Again, we've got incredible wind resources, we've got great solar resources. Why not? use the, the coal resource that we have, make the, the hydrogen, use the, the coal that's left, or sorry, use the carbon that's left over from, from making the hydrogen and use that carbon to make other things, mm -hmm. fights or, or uh, other chemicals that we might need. Great. Well, listen, let's, uh, if there are more questions, you can send them to me and then I could forward them on to Bob. We could try to Please. get um, some feedback that way. Also, uh, this, this lecture has been recorded and it will be a, a video recording of it will be posted on the, on the website uh, where you found the link to the webinar, probably in three or four days. And so if you want to share it with someone, you can find it there, or point someone there as well. So Bob, thanks so much. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thanks. And, yeah, digging into that. That was fascinating. Thank you. All right. Have a great night. Okay, you too. Thanks.